Okay. The hat's for Tony. Ah. I would have a cigar just to please him even more, but I can't do these with a cigar. And it's also too late for me to stop. Indian Abyss. Yeah? Now, everybody and their mother have covered this already. Uh, and in fact, it, the coverage by some people whom I respect and trust, uh, along with, of course, the designer itself, and his other works convinced me finally, okay, I'll break down and buy this. I'm not sure how interested I am in a Colombian drug war. And I'm still not sure how interested I am in the Colombian drug war, although maybe reading some of the... Uh, there's a massive amount of information about this you know, situation just in it, about each of the cards, little blurbs of historical stuff that's not in there, and then discussion uh, from the designer notes as well. Not a whole lot of sort of a pure narrative history. You kind of have to piece it together out of everything. But, uh, you know, a lot of information here that'll help make the game. Uh, maybe more interesting topic wise to me than it wouldn't would otherwise have been. And I'm not saying I'm disinterested in, in the topic, just that there's a reason that these kind of topics don't generally uh, get covered. But when you take something like this, a design this innovative, um and 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 express the whole sort of genre of how you're gonna handle counterinsurgency in this kind of light level uh, with these really new uh, mechanisms in place. Well, yeah, there's a reason that everybody's sort of chiming in and saying, what a great game. It is. It really is. Uh, now, for me, I got about halfway through it, I began getting a certain fatigue. A fatigue that normally with a CDG happens earlier. And I usually pull back and start giving sort of this narrative of the whole story that's going on instead of worrying about each play. Here I was detailing each play, and that's what was fatiguing me. And uh, I think I would have done everyone a bigger favor, myself, viewers, whatever, by trying to step away from that. But the problem is, it was new enough to me, and the first CDGs hit me the same way when I played uh, well, the first ones for me, when I played Twilight Struggle for the first time. I had a really hard time not covering each card play. In fact, that's exactly what I did in very bad form uh, to boot. And I've gotten kind of used to those and been able to move away to that, you know, higher picture because I can see the picture now. And it's especially easy uh, maybe in some of the others. And I can remember what happened. But in this, new system, very new system, and it was much, much harder to provide the level of video that I'm used to, which is a lot of detail early on and then kind of spreading out and being able to give the narrative because I can't find the narrative. <laughs> and I had this problem with Twilight Struggle and now, you know, after I played Twilight Struggle a couple of times, I can find it. It's just, it's such a different design. So what's so different about it? Well, the cards. And it's a beautiful idea. I mean, it really is. So. They're an event deck. They come up and they say, here's what's happening. Deal with it. And it's having that... Um, it may be less realistic to have the pre-drawn card to take advantage of and look at, but I think the game would lose a lot of its gamey, positive aspects. Uh, being able to make any kind of planning or whatever, it would just be a, a random event deck piling up with, oh, what do you want to do, what do you want to do? And you would almost always take an action rather than pass because you don't know what's coming up. I mean, whenever you have an option to take an action, I think you would if it was a random event deck. Uh, but having that added foresight, uh, you know, it, 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 can, it, it can help you make some decisions that otherwise 
the game would fit into sort of this neat little pattern where, oh, two guys go, now two guys go, now two guys go, and it would just get stuck that way throughout. But now the, you know, with that advanced card, you get to the point where the order on the cards, which faction goes which, becomes an important part of the decision-making process. Because you look at that card in advance and say, okay, do I want to do anything with that card? Am I going to get a chance to do what I want to do with it? Or do I just pass off and do something kind of lighter now? Or do I just wait around and hope for something to happen? I don't know. Uh, but the biggie there is, you're usually, if you have an option to do something on the current card, you want to take it unless you got something at least as good on the next card. In fact, probably better. Because otherwise, you're kicking the can down the road, and it's going to fall off the fiscal cliff. And, uh, <laughs> no, and, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're taking a very minor advantage, one resource, in exchange for delaying on an action, waiting for maybe a better opportunity. Well, if you're pretty sure you're not going to get that opportunity on the next card, if you think you're going to do just as well with this card, and just as well as better than taking a resource, which it isn't always, okay? There are times when the pass is a, a completely viable option, even when you don't have anything coming up, I think. Maybe to lie low and build up uh, stocks, maybe because you need cash. If, if you if you outrun your, your production, although that should be pretty hard. I didn't see it done, and I'm pretty good at making big mistakes, right? Um, all right, let's talk about the components a little bit. First thing that really impressed me, the cards. So I'm so used to the deluxe treatment cards being these really stiff things. These, these are neither the really stiff cards that come with things like uh, uh, Here I Stand deluxe version, nor are they... The kind of flimsy cards that I'm sure a lot of people are a little iffy about, and I'm okay with, but I do kind of think, well, if I played this 20 times, I'm not sure they'd hold up. These are much more sturdy. Uh, they're almost as sturdy as the really stiff ones, but they do shuffle well enough. Uh, they're like a real deck of cards, you know, but a fairly sturdy deck of cards as opposed to, uh, you know, some of the some of the lighter ones. Rulebook, nice and thin. I had a hellish time reading this. I'm not sure why. Um, maybe because it's really a summation, when it comes down to it, of these suckers. These are what you need to play. You open one of these up and it tells you everything. Now, there's some discrepancies between the two. I found a one or two of them, and they're kind of disturbing because, you know, it may just be a missed word here or something like that, but... You really rely on the player aid, and yes, the player aids are fantastic on this. They tell you everything that every power can do, except for the fact that in a couple of places they might mislead you or actually contradict the rules by the way they work. Okay, um, but these really tell you everything you need in the from the rules, and so the rules become almost a an attempt to reproduce these in a little bit more with a little bit of explanation in it. But reading through the rules, I didn't get kind of a, what the hell's going on? And then I turned to this massive 44-page playbook. And what's the first thing I see in here? A tutorial. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll kind of fiddle around with it on there. But, you know, this is even too procedural for by taste. The rule book's a little procedural in the sense of do this, do that, do that. But this is much worse because it's like, okay, set this up. I was expecting maybe kind of a, a playthrough or something like that, and I think there is one somewhere maybe or embedded within it. But this is just so verbose and procedural between them that I just stepped back and said, I can't face this. You know, i I got to find some other way. Maybe I'll just start playing and then start videoing, you know, I'll play a couple rounds, a couple cards off of it, and then start over the way I would with, say, Axis Empires. This is nowhere near as complex a game. Uh, there's a note, uh, Guide to Strategy Operations. This looks like a useful thing. I've peeked at it a little bit to see, hey, why, why, why does the government have bases? Just because I was flipping through and I saw the counter there. I generally don't like to look at things like that if I can avoid it. <coughs> a long one-player example of play. 
Um, that's another thing. Within this, what, 16 pages of rules, you also have the AI system written out, uh, which takes a couple of those pages. So this is really not a lot of reading. And you have this big in, uh, glossary, which spells things out. Now, I, again, I have trouble with that kind of format. Uh, it's not, oh, there shouldn't be a glossary. There definitely should be. But if that's where I find all the terms in the only place, it's just difficult for me. I'm used to reading something that feels more like prose. And, well, the more we get away from that, and the more we get into do this, do this, do this, with no why, the harder it is, uh, I had the hardest time facing these rules. But then again, I had a hard time facing some of the new systems like Twilight Struggle or uh, Labyrinth as well. My old brain's ossified. Um, lots of examples here. But this was the sweetest thing. This was, after reading the rules once, I ran into the design notes. No! They don't discuss the rules in a lot of depth. In fact, a lot of them are kind of background type stuff. History. But you know what? This was the thing that allowed me to understand what the game was about. Uh, because there were some hints in there about what the game was about, which there weren't in the rule book. <laughs> Not to me. The rule book was very much, you do this, 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 and you're winning. Um, Usually I read designer notes afterwards because I have questions after I read. And I did hear after I read the rules. I have questions about, well, why did you do that? In this, I didn't understand what was done until I read this. Now, I understood it even better once I set up the board and looked at these things. But that's not the way I think. I have a hard time. Uh, I'm used to, I'm going to read a rule book. I take it with me to places like the toilet or bed where I don't have a board set up but I'm not going to have all that. And that's what I'm used to doing and that wasn't going to happen here. There's also this, uh, for every card, uh, an explanation of what the card itself does which doesn't look too much, it looks like it's about the same detail as on the cards. Maybe a complete re repetition of what's on the cards. And then a little historical thing. Now this is important for what's on the cards in case some of those cards, I mean, it's important for some people because they want to look things up and know what everything is and be able to plan in advance what might be happening, what might not. But, it's not so important in this game because you run through the deck once and you can paw through it and find the card if you, if you didn't know what the effect was. So if a counter isn't, and some of them aren't, isn't specific enough. Okay. So that's two of the big components to it. Like I said, the player aids look tremendous. Uh, then there's this non-player uh, little flow charts, which are part of the solitaire or less than four player games. If you're playing less than four players, you have to, well, you don't have to, but it's possible to play it with these other powers kind of running themselves. The board is fantastic, except it kind of pooched out of the box. It didn't lay flat. With some books on it or just playing on it for a while, it got a lot better, and I assume I'll never have that issue with it again. It's just, you know, fresh game, right? Uh, then we get a little sequence of play, and this planning map, which you're never allowed to leave the table, so, uh, you know, all conversations are supposed to be open. So I don't know how much value that really is, but... I wonder what these arrows are. There's all kind of arrows on it. They certainly don't indicate a flow of movement. Maybe it's some kind of numbering system or something. Maybe it's used in the solitaire game. I don't know. Uh, nice wooden pieces, obviously. These are like the uh, labyrinth pieces with the little star. And that little hole... Uh, mechanic. It's weird how it's worded in the rules. I think it works very well. But again, they're, it's active. Well, once it's active, why can't it do anything? It just seems a little strange to use that word. It comes with some nice wooden, I guess, painted dice to match three of the four colors. The people who actually have to roll dice. Little pawns. Just totally a play to help you mark what you're using. I found them really, really valuable. A bunch of counters, good quality. Uh, 
need clipping still. But looks like the corners were rounded already. I don't. Well, not all of them. I think I clipped some of these. Uh, the game itself, you know, um, I think it's probably. I don't know. I I, I really think that the. Uh, the card play mechanism, which is so key and it's the heart of the whole system, is just so impressive. The rest of it feels kind of Euro-ish. You know, the actions that are going on in here, I pick something, I do this, this, and this. Uh, I've got limitations on my movement. I have to buy each, each thing I do. Uh, that all doesn't feel you know, as new as the uh, card system. But the card system itself just totally impresses me. It gets away from a lot of the problems that CDGs just sort of inherently bring about. The players don't have the kind of control they do in the CDG. It feels like an opportunity has arisen and different people have different dibs on it, you know, different people could grab it more quickly depending on, you know, how they're poised and everything, but it's still an event that happens. It's not something that I have control over. People aren't going around. Some of them, you may kind of make an argument of, well, how come I'm able to foil that, you know, why... why why is my picking a turn going to mean that the uh, government, you know, aid failed? You know, or it didn't work out well. What did I do about that? And that is kind of weird about it. But the actual flow of the mechanism and everything, I really, really like. And I think, you know, this is going to just really catch people. I'm hoping... See, one of the things about this is, in some ways, especially with the picture, it looks more wargamish than I think it's meant to appeal to. This is a game that really is, you know, even, uh, it's more on that Labyrinth, Twilight Struggle type level. It's, but with the multiplayer aspect, it's reaching back to um, some of these almost Ameritrashy type games but it's not, you know, it, 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 it's sort of this, okay, it happens to have military uh, actions going on, and you definitely are smacking people around in this, but it's very much one of these kind of elegant designs where everything isn't spelled out in very much detail. Um, and I think it's going to be very uh, appealing and I, its rating certainly shows that it is, but I think it's going to be appealing to a fairly broad segment of the population in the same way that the big ones, the Labyrinth, the uh, Twilight Struggle, not in the way, say, Wilderness War, Volko is uh, one of my favorite games uh, in the card-driven uh, segment, but, you know, that is very clearly a military oriented game. You're moving troops, you're doing things in a, in a particular way. This one is more like Labyrinth in the sense that, you know, you're, you're conducting this campaign that's all about this strategy and really not too much about the details. Uh, now, the strategy may not be always the high-level strategy, especially in this. In Labyrinth, you kind of feel like, at least as the U.S. player, you're really plotting out uh, the U.S. reaction to situations. In this, I feel more like I'm playing a game than uh, in, some, in some of the others. But I think the game mechanism, like in things like Geronimo, is just, you know, so up there in terms of this new, cool idea. Uh, and it really, really works well. Uh, it keeps everybody in the game. There's so much opportunity to shoot each other down. And it's very easy to see, in general, Who's, get, who's a threat to win the game on the next propaganda card? The one little tricky thing there is I think the FARC and the government can sneak a win in at the end of the game uh, e more easily than some of the other players. But I'm not sure. That's just kind of a, a guess. Anyway, I think this is uh, a game that...
deserves the rating that it has on board. Not many do. Uh, I think most ratings are pretty inflated, but uh, I don't know. This is rating above an 8, and I'm certainly going to give it an 8. It takes me a while to give something a 9. We'll see after a couple more plays, but uh, there's something really innovative here and something that I think works very well. My only worry, how much am I going to be able to capture that narrative? When I'm playing it alone, not trying to videotape everything, not trying to catch everything, just playing it and trying to enjoy it. Uh, I reached that point in some other games, certainly in Twilight Struggle Labyrinth, as long as I got away from the camera and the description. So I got pretty high hopes that this is going to be a good one for me.